Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. This gospel reading is quite shocking. We don't expect to see or hear Jesus ignoring somebody and then when he does respond, say, you dog. How, how can Jesus say that to a woman who's asking him for help? It's shocking. It's shocking to our 21st century ears. But at the time, it probably wasn't that shocking to Jesus' disciples. That's probably what they kind of expected. Um, the Gentiles, now we're in a region, uh, we're told that she's a Syrophoenician woman, and that means she's from the place of Phoenicia that's controlled by Syria, as opposed to the Phoenicians who would be um, controlled by um, Libya, I think it is. And we've got almost the same story in Matthew, except that it refers to her as the Canaanite woman. Well, one, the Syrophoenician woman tells us where she lived geographically, the Canaanite tells us what religion she was. And so for a Gentile woman to come to a Jewish man, Jesus, and ask, speak to him and ask for anything would have been outrageous in their culture. She's a woman, she's a foreigner, she's from a different, she's not Jewish. For her to approach him would have been outrageous. So for Jesus in Matthew, Jesus ignores them and the disciples say, tell her to go away. Just tell her to go away. But Jesus doesn't call it go away. He responds to her and he says, well, I'm really here. My ministry is for the people of Israel, not for the Gentile people. And so, and, and he uses this uh, metaphor of feeding the children. So the Israelites are the children. And in this example, the Gentiles are the dogs. Now, in that culture, a dog, some of them would be the dogs, scavenger dogs out on the street. My understanding is the Gentiles um, actually would have pet dogs. 
and most of you have, a lot of you have children, nieces, nephews, and you know that when, a, when you're at a meal and you have a dog, at least I know in our house, if, hey, who hasn't passed a piece of their broccoli they didn't want under the table to the dog? And so they understand that metaphor. We understand that metaphor. Now, there's, what's, why is Mark telling this story this way? Well, we see in the story last week, you remember, um, Jesus was, uh, the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, why aren't your disciples following our traditions, washing your hands? And he says, it's not what we eat, it's not what we put in our mouth, it's what comes out of our hearts, our hearts as opposed to our mouth. That's important. And then Jesus seems to be going right against that of insulting this woman, the Syrophoenician woman. Well, the story of the Syrophoenician woman, Jesus is, uh, it's in the Gentile territory. So the Gentiles will be the ones in power. They'll be the ones ruling. But there will also be some Jewish homes. So presumably when it says Jesus came and went into a house and was trying to be away, presumably to get some rest and peace, he was probably staying with a Jewish family. But the Jewish family would not, they would be in the minority. So they, they wouldn't be the ones benefiting from the society they're in. But in this story, Jesus is still agreeing to heal the child of one of the Gentiles. The next story, the second one in here, of the man that's a, a mute and deaf, we don't know what he is, so it's just reasonable to assume he was one of the Gentiles. Uh, sorry one of the Jewish families there. He could be Jewish just as well as Gentile, but he was in the Gentile territory. And the next story that would be after this one, but we didn't read it today, is the feeding of the 4,000, which is very similar to the story of feeding the 5,000 that we've already had. The 5,000 would have been in the Jewish territory, the 4,000 in the Gentile territory, so Mark is probably saying that Jesus was able to do miracles, he was able to heal people, he was able to cast out um, demons, he was able to feed people, both in the Jewish territory and in the Gentile territory. Another way of interpreting this is that maybe Jesus, who we believe was fully human and fully divine, maybe in his humanity was saying, look, I'm here for the Jewish people. I don't, I don't just at this time can't be working with the Gentile people. So maybe the woman pushing back on what Jesus was saying was an opportunity for Jesus to learn that his ministry was not just to the Jewish people, but also to the Gentile people, to all people. And so we could say that perhaps Jesus learned, changed, and grew in his, um, his opinion of people. That's an interpretation. We don't like to think of Jesus not being perfect, but he was human. So maybe this was an opportunity for him to learn that God loved all people, not just the Jewish people. Another interpretation of this is the agency that Jesus gave to this woman. Quite often, many women would not have a voice. And he's given her an opportunity for a voice. Because when she came and fell at his feet and begged them to heal his daughter, her daughter, Jesus could have sent her away, ignored her, which is what the disciples wanted. But instead, he actually engaged in dialogue with her. He talked to her. He bantered back and forth. When he insulted her, saying, hey, I'm here to feed the children, not the dogs, she accepted that. And she said, yes, but even the dogs get to feed. And she said, I need you to heal my daughter. I want you to heal my daughter. And Jesus healed her daughter 
before saying that, he said, your daughter is healed. Go home. And when she went home, she found the demon was gone. Jesus didn't have to come up and touch her. She was somewhere else. And Jesus' divinity, his power to heal, cast out demons, reached into the distance of wherever this child was. So Jesus has given this woman a voice. Another way of looking at this story is that I understand in the time, uh, in those times, that if people wanted to introduce a new idea, one way would be to go along with the traditional way of thinking about it, and then make an abrupt change, turn to the left or right. So the disciples were totally okay with Jesus insulting this woman. They said, go away. They weren't as shocked as we are at that where they were shocked is when Jesus actually engaged with the woman and healed her daughter. That would have been a great shock. That would have been the shock for the Jewish people, for the Jesus disciples. It's the fact that he actually talked to this woman and healed her child. So what does this story mean to us? Well, I think we today also have things that we come to believe, how things should be. And we also need a shock in our lives of being able to suddenly realize something different. And so perhaps for some of it, it'll be the shock of knowing that God loves you and me, but that he also loves the stranger. So we have Afghan refugees and asylum seekers who are seeking to escape from the war in Afghanistan and come here. That might be a shock for us to realize that God loves the Afghanistan people as well. Or the people who are coming to our southern border. God loves them too. Everyone is a child of God. To know that someone from one of the South American countries is also a son or a daughter of God might be a shock for some people. Maybe not you, but when we listen to the news, we know that there's certainly people who don't want to think of Syrians, Muslims, Afghanistan people, or people from Latin Latina countries may not want to consider them as being beloved children of God. And so that may be a shock to some people to know that. And so what I ask of you is to consider where God's love, love of all people, is a shock to you. Where do you see God including someone that you haven't thought of including? Amen. Amen.